My name is Dean Baker. My family, for five generations, have been ranching and farming in eastern Nevada and western Utah. Now Dean Baker, his three sons, and their families continue growing crops and working cattle, much as Bakers have for nearly eight decades. But now their environment, their ranch, their rural lifestyle, and that of their neighbors who make their living from the land here in Snake Valley on the Utah border have been threatened as never before. They're already pumping underground water with large negative impacts to the valley. They realize that if there is even greater pumping of underground water for transfer out of the basins, the impact of the environment and all else will be huge. Las Vegas's water agency the Southern Nevada Water Authority, or SENWA, wants to build a 300-mile pipeline to transfer water from eastern Nevada to meet the growing water needs of metropolitan southern Nevada. When I talk about this subject, I don't try to talk about those of us in eastern Nevada being against Las Vegas. This pipeline will hurt Las Vegas more than it will hurt us. But it will hurt Snake Valley and eastern Nevada in many ways. This is Dean Baker's story about the negative impact this 300-mile pipeline will have on eastern Nevada. Now, when you look at this picture, that's my mother. As a child, even when he was much littler than in this picture, he was in the fields with his mother while she was running a dump break. You can see him right there next to the wheel. His entire life has been spent on the land land that needed water. This is an aerial view of the town of Baker. The town is at the top and below that you'll see a meadow. That meadow is sub-irrigated. Sub-irrigated means the water table under the meadow is generally close enough to the surface to reach the roots of the grass in the meadow. This creates a pasture that can be a meadow for many centuries naturally without irrigation. The sub-irrigated meadows can also be flood irrigated with mountain, creek, or spring water. When irrigation wells are drilled, the water near the surface like this is pulled down into the well. Ranchers in Snake Valley and most other valleys with irrigation wells pull the water down, drying up springs, and sub-irrigated land. But ranches and farms that irrigate their crops have also created and become the major home for wildlife and birds and snakes and insects. These are pictures of our fields and meadows with wild animals and birds that live here all year long. Snake Valley ranches are obviously a home for wildlife. Deer will stay on the ranch all winter. Here you can see cattle in the meadow behind the deer. This picture was taken out of the window of one of the baker's houses. You can see six bucks. Here again you see the cows behind them in the fields where the crops are produced. Of course there are birds as well. Here's a shot of geese and sandhill cranes. The cranes are the birds on the bottom. The Baker Ranch provides a home to many of them. Dean, a veteran pilot, flies over them with his plane so frequently they don't even bother to fly. Antelope, too, live on the ranches, and while they now feed in the fields, they were here long before ranching began here. This is a picture of Baker cattle in the spring as they are brought in off the desert where they have spent the winter. They're brought in off their winter range to summer on the meadows on the ranch with their calves. In the fall, the calves will go to the feed yard and the mother cows will go back out on the range for the winter. Behind these cows you see Mount Wheeler, which is over 13,000 feet tall. It's one of the highest mountains in Nevada. There are mountain peaks in the Snake Range that are nearly as high and are similar in elevation to the Sierra Nevada Mountains in California. But the amount of rain and snow the two ranges collect is very different. 
The Sierra Nevadas collect moisture in the form of rain and snow as it comes off the Pacific Ocean, giving California abundant water. The passes between Baker and Ely are similar in elevation to the Sierra's Donner Pass. In fact, Connor Pass between Snake Valley and Ely is actually higher than the pass where the Donner Party was stranded in 1849. But where Connor Pass may receive 15 inches of snow in a storm, it's not uncommon for Donner Pass to get up to 15 feet. That's the difference between the Sierras and our eastern Nevada mountains. They get much more snow and moisture. After crossing Nevada's arid Great Basin, there is very little moisture left in the storms that reach Mount Wheeler and our other peaks. Many compare the situation with the proposed pipeline from Snake Valley with what happened in California's Owens Valley over a hundred years ago. This was a lush valley at the base of the Sierra Nevada mountains that became a wasteland after Los Angeles took their abundant water via aqueducts and pipelines to accommodate Southern California's explosive growth. Eastern Nevada, where Snake Valley is located, is one of the areas with the least precipitation at this elevation in the United States. The Sierra Nevada gets 15 times as much water as Mount Wheeler in eastern Nevada. The water available in eastern Nevada is nothing compared to Owens Valley, California. This picture shows three subjects. The first is an electric power line that came into Snake Valley in the 1970s. Second, a productive field irrigated with underground water pumped by electricity starting in the 1970s. And third, a well drilled by the BLM in 1936 that filled the six-inch pipe flowing full out of the ground. When Dean first dealt with this well in the 1950s, the six-inch pipe was always full, pouring water into an old wooden trough that even then was rotten. I replaced the wooden troughs with these metal tanks. The well from the 1930s to 1970s made a swamp with a pond for ducks and geese. Now the well doesn't flow at all and is down 10 to 20 feet because the bakers and others have used electric power since the 1970s to pump more water and irrigate more farmland. This is a field with a whole series of pivot irrigation systems created with underground pumping. The crops produced by these pivots provide more forage for wildlife and cattle than previously was available from just the pond. Last fall at the northwest corner pivot in our lower flat fields, I counted 78 antelope on this pivot alone. This is a picture of the dried up old antelope spring. It was clearly the home for Indians before the settlers came in the 1800s. It's near the pivot where 78 antelope ate and drank last fall. There's now more food and water for wildlife than that originally available from the springs dried up using electricity for underground pumping. Imagine the difference. An interbasin transfer of this water to Las Vegas will leave no water and no food for wildlife. This is Cane Springs. It's about three miles north of Antelope Spring. During the 1930s depression, the Civil Conservation Corps built a trough there. Cane Springs is a pond where the cattle come in and drink. This spring still flows well, and the bakers still use it to haul water to their cattle in the mountains. Between this spring and the antelope spring, there were a half dozen springs in years past. But now there are only two of the little springs still flowing near Cane Spring. This shows very clearly that when we pump enough water, it dries up springs, and it dries up wells. It's a much different situation with water now with the large electrically driven irrigation systems than it was when ranchers were not pumping much from underneath the ground. 
Ranchers are learning that there is a delicate balance concerning how much water they can pump and what they must allow for recharge. To them it defies logic that there could be enough water to send millions of gallons to Las Vegas each year. There are all kinds of wildlife in these springs, like owls and insects and snails. These snails only live in places where they have a dependable water supply for thousands of years. This is the town of Eskdale. It's across the valley over the Utah border. It's where the high school for this valley is located. The people who have settled and developed Eskdale came here to practice their religion, but they're also fine farmers. When they drilled for water for their agricultural needs, they only had to go down a hundred feet. They're still using these same wells today. As their community grew and they needed additional water for their homes and the school, they had to drill a different kind of well that would be sealed below 100 feet. It is the least productive well Eskdale has. Eskdale is a fine community with an excellent dairy that sends truckloads of milk to dairies across the West every week. Eskdale also produces excellent dairy cattle that they sell across the country. This is a picture of the Eskdale 4th of July celebration. People from all over the valley come for the shows and excellent food. They have a fine fireworks display that night. When the Utah Geological Service drilled over 30 wells in this area to find where the water was, what they found is that the water's all near the surface. When they drilled a thousand feet, they found that there's only a small amount of ancient water that was too full of minerals to be drunk alone. It had to be mixed with water near the surface to even be palatable. What the area residents have learned is that their whole valley was largely part of ancient Lake Bonneville, the bottom of which formed a solid table that keeps all the water near the surface. That is why we think the pipeline project will be a total failure. Southern Nevada Water Authority thinks they will find water deep in the underground aquifers. Those in the valley have only found it near the surface. It appears that high valleys like Snake and Spring Valley are sealed from old lakes far in the past. Now if you go south of Eskdale, you see changes. This is a parcel of land that the government did not allow for private ownership in the early 1900s. They held it back as a public water source. This once was actually a pond and there was a spring where the bakers ran cattle. Now that spring is totally dried up. The reason the federal government didn't sell this land was because not only was this good water, but they needed water for the teams hauling supplies and materials from Utah to the mines further west in Nevada. They would stop here at night to feed and water their teams. You can see that snails lived in these clean water springs. This huge dry area was once a spring. It's completely dry now. Dean has seen it when it was the single biggest dust source in the valley. Coming over the pass into this valley, it would look like a bomb exploded on windy days. About 10 or 15 miles north is Beck Spring, a spring with very good water, and it even flowed during the long drought of the 1930s. Governor Huntsman of Utah was here with Dean one day looking at this spring. He thought the water good enough, so he got himself a cup and had a drink. The bakers have always drunk the water out of Beck Springs. Interestingly, it's also the home of a frog that's been listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act, the Columbian spotted frog. Those are its eggs. Now this presents a problem for Sinwa. If these springs dry up, the frog living in these springs will be gone. They know they can't be drying up springs with threatened species. They'll need to have other places they can put our frog here if this spring dries up. This is Warm Springs. It's used by the ranches near the town of Gandy. This is a productive spring. 
Senwa intends to put its pipeline right here. The spring is on the Nevada-Utah state line. The pipeline in Nevada will potentially dry up this spring in Utah. Utah is very concerned about warm springs. East of warm springs out in the valley is this spring that also has a species that's been petitioned for listing under the Endangered Species Act. The least chub is only found in a handful of places. It's another problem for Senwa. Now this is Fish Springs, a fish and wildlife refuge. It's located about 60 miles further north in Utah toward the Great Salt Lake. This is currently a huge marsh where thousands of birds stop on their way north and south each year. It's been proven that water coming from Nevada aquifers provide a substantial water source for this refuge. This is Lehman's Cave in the Great Basin National Park. These remarkable formations in the cave are created by mineral water flowing down into the cave from above over thousands and thousands of years. The water evaporates, leaving minerals that create these spectacular forms. Park officials are very concerned that not only will drawing down the water in Snake Valley impact Lehman Cave, but also all the other water sources in this national park. South of Great Basin National Park is the best fish rearing station in the state of Nevada. Perfect water, just the right temperature to hatch and grow fish. They built one in southern Nevada, but it has never worked as well as this hatchery. The water here is just better, and the fish have no health problems. Both Snake Creek and Big Springs from Burbank Meadows flow down into the town of Garrison. It was settled in 1870. Brigham Young sent Mormons to populate this area as early as 1852. The Gonder family still owns part of it and still has land here in what we call the Burbank Meadow. They've been here for 150 years. Just south of Garrison is Garrison Lake or Pruis Lake. There was a dam built here in the late 1800s and there was a small lake there before. This lake is used to irrigate Garrison farmland but it's also used by wildlife, it's used for recreation and it's been a favorite fishing destination for many years. South of here is the Clay Springs area. This is where a 3C camp was located that built many irrigation projects and troughs for livestock. This is where Utah Geological is measuring the water because they're concerned that this will be one of the first springs affected by the pipeline. The Big Springs and the State Line Big Springs, as well as sub-irrigation, are the major water source for this Burbank Meadow area. Some of the first settlers to cross the United States settled in the Burbank Meadows. It has changed little. The settlers found many Indians living here because it was an important source of food for them. Wildlife, waterfowl, and fish were abundant. Here again, all the water in the Burbank Meadow is held along the surface, making it a huge meadow complemented by sub-irrigation. This is a close-up of the surface water in Big Springs. Senwa doesn't feel a water drawdown of only a foot or two will hurt the environment, but this surface water is obviously critical to the survival of the Burbank Meadows. Pull it down a foot, there won't be any ice here in the winter, nor surface water in the summer. This area is critical to over 2,000 mother cows and their calves beef that's an important food source. Also, all the wildlife will be gone when there is that kind of a drawdown. This is a picture of Lower Big Springs. This is a very productive spring, but this channel coming into it is from the Upper Big Springs, which puts both springs together and they flow on into the huge Burbank Meadow. This is one of several flumes that measure water in the area. The water flows from here out into the Burbank Meadows. This is where Big Springs comes out of the ground. 
where 11 CFS of water comes out. Looking on further south, this is the South Big Springs area. There are a number of small springs that create sub-irrigated meadow here. But where the trees are is Big Springs. I have counted 16 other places within a quarter of a mile where water comes to the surface. None of them are large springs like this central one. So that is the one Southern Nevada Water Authority measures and keeps track of. One of the things that shows these drawdowns will happen are these fields here that were created south of the Burbank Meadows. After 2000, a fellow bought up all of this private land even though the wells produced poor water. But this new landowner thought, I can buy this land, get the water rights, stall pivots, and when Las Vegas builds the pipeline, I'll sell my water to him. He tried hard to do that, but Needle Point Springs is across the hill from it, and when he started pumping in 2000... Lo and behold, it draws the water down and dries the spring up. No one knew it would dry Needle Point Springs up. It is known historically as a never drying up ever before. Cattle and sheep have watered here as well as generations of wild horses. When that spring dried up, 17 wild horses died and were buried there. That spring has never come back. It was improved by the three seas. They built the pond and everything. Here's a picture of the drawdown. The BLM has kept track of it. The red horizontal line essentially indicates ground layer. The left side begins in 2001. When he got all his pivots going and started pumping, Needle Point Springs dried up quickly with the water level flowing below the red horizontal line. In the fall, when he stopped pumping, it started filling up, but it never came back to ground surface. The next year it went down, and each year it goes down, and it's still going down. And it gets lower and lower each year. It's clear that he's not only is drawing this spring down, but he's also affecting lower big springs, and there are questions he may be affecting upper big springs. This is an example of the size of the pipeline Senwa wants to put in, seven feet tall. If it extends all the way to Las Vegas as proposed, it will dry up all of eastern Nevada. They will have to keep it full because they will have spent over $15 billion to build it. They can't justify spending that much money on a project and then say that they'll only pump when they need it. They're going to have to keep it full whether they need the water or not, just to pay for it. Water is tremendously valuable. Whether they need it or not, they will pump it and turn it to money. That's just my opinion and how it's going to be done. So a seven-foot pipeline full is not going to do anything for eastern Nevada. Eastern Nevada, the area with the least precipitation in the United States. Eastern Nevada does have food production, has wildlife, it has a wonderful environment. If you pull the water away, everything we value here is going to be gone. The reality is that in Dean's life experience of 70 plus years, all the water has been found near the surface of the ground. Baker ranches, Utah Geological, and the USGS have found very little pumpable water below 300 feet. At a thousand feet, there's hardly any water, and it's old and undrinkable. When ranchers do find water, it's mining the valley water, drying up springs and sub-irrigated meadows. Large pumping for interbasin transfers out of Snake Valley won't work, and I think this will be the same for all high elevation eastern Nevada valleys. What we're clearly learning is that where there is pumping to water farmland, whether it's Baker Ranches, other ranches, Eskdale, or as illustrated in the last slides, we're mining the water. It's going down every year. 
It is clearly proven that this pipeline project taking this much water out of our valley simply isn't going to work. It will be an environmental disaster. My name is Dean Baker. I'm a bullheaded, opinionated old goat, but I believe everything in this is true. Thank you for taking the time to hear my story.